Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 1, Solomon says, Who is a wise person or a wise man? Who knows the interpretation or the explanation of a thing? Wisdom brightens a man's face and changes its hard or stern appearance. In ancient Near Eastern history, when they spoke about the brightening of a face, it was a smile. It was the brightening of the eyes. It was uh, a, a sense of contentment and happiness. It also spoke of God's blessing upon a person's life. As the Old Testament talks about, the Lord will make his light to shine upon you. And so a wise person is one who can go from a stern face or a grumpy face or I can't do any of those <laughs> unless I'm at home but can go from a stern face or a grumpy face or a sad face or a discouraged face or a depressed face or whatever and can bring a smile to it can bring brightness to it and that is what God's wisdom does now, Solomon is going to look at two particular areas that, uh, of wisdom that we can follow to help bring brightness to our faces. And the first one deals with protocol or chain of command or etiquette or propriety. In life, these are very important principles of wisdom, whether it's in the home whether it's at work, whether it's at school, chain of command or propriety or protocol is a very important principle of wisdom. Because you can be very, very right about something, but go about it in a very wrong manner. You can be very, very correct about something, but if you don't follow the company principles or the chain of command, or the best avenue of communication, you just won't get your point across, will you? Now, the illustration from Solomon deals with the king. And I could imagine that he would be in favor of uh, such principles, seeing how he was the king. He says in Ecclesiastes verse 2, chapter 8, verse 2, he says, Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. In ancient Near Eastern history, and, and even today, when people swear allegiance to the country or to the king or to their government, very, very often it involved an oath before God also. I pledge allegiance to this flag, right? United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, what? Under God. We won't debate that now. But God is still in control. But God is a part of the pledge. And in ancient Near Eastern history, it was all part of it, and particularly for the nation of Israel. For the unique thing with the nation of Israel was that the king was subordinate to God and subordinate to the people also by the laws of the Mosaic Code. Nobody was above the law or above God. But you had to have order. And therefore he says, Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. We are commanded to fear the Lord and the king and to not join in rebellion against him. Verse 3, Do not be in a hurry to leave or resign service in the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause. For he, the king, will do whatever he wishes. There is a wisdom that says that you ought to think about your actions before you take action. And if you do take action, then you ought to follow the protocol. And you ought to recognize this, that those who are in authority over you or your superiors have a certain measure of power over you also. Verse for since a king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? 
in ancient Near Eastern history, you didn't challenge the king. Remember the story of Nehemiah? How he was very fearful when the king noticed that he was looking depressed and sad in his presence. If you were to tick off the king, he could chop off your head. Or remember how Esther had to risk her life to even go into the presence of the king. And if he did not receive her, she would be on her way. Fortunately, we do not ourselves in America experience that kind of authority over us. But there is still a wisdom to respecting one's superior, to respecting protocol and chain of command. Uh, It's very, very difficult when you go over someone's head, correct? To accomplish what you think is a good goal that most often is seen as rebellion and it obscures the point that you hope to make. In verse 5, whoever obeys the king's command will come to no harm and the wise heart will know the proper time and the proper procedure. Timing can be everything, can't it? You may want to say something to someone, maybe your boss, maybe someone in your family, maybe someone in your neighborhood, uh, maybe an instructor. You may want to say something to someone And you may be absolutely true and right, but following procedures and finding the proper timing is the art of reconciliation and communication. Timing. And so we must pause and we must contemplate and we must pray that when we go through protocol or the chain of command, or we have issues to talk to someone about, that we follow those proper procedures and that we prayerfully look for a good time. For instance, in my particular life, if you want to talk to me about something important, generally speaking, after 11, 11.30 or 12 o'clock at night is not the best time. I'm usually exhausted. I'm usually ready to vegetate or to do something like that. Probably for a husband or for a wife, as soon as they come home from work, uh, that's probably not the best time to talk about issues, is it? If they're serious issues. Or when a husband comes home and the wife's been there all day with the children, uh, you know, it's time for him to pitch in and uh, bring a relief inning to that game and to not talk about serious issues. There is a proper time, and there is a proper procedure. And for those who follow that proper timing and procedure, they will not come to harm before the king. Verse 6, For there is a proper time and a proper procedure for every matter, though a man's misery weighs heavily upon him. Yes, you may be burdened, You may be troubled. You may be agitated about a particular issue. But if you take that agitation and that tension and that emotion into the time of communication, it's not going to go as well, is it? If you just barge right in and don't give the person the atmosphere, the opportunity to really be able to hear what you have to say, it's probably not going to go very well. Solomon gives us the wisdom. Look for the proper timing. Look for the proper procedure. Verse 7, why? Since no man knows the future, who can tell him what is to come? A wise man will follow protocol in every matter. Even if the problem is very great and miserable, a person should still, according to Solomon, follow proper procedures. Even though the king is sovereign over his kingdom, remember that God is sovereign over the king. And so you trust the one who holds the future, 
you trust God to guide and direct you. Now in verse 8, he says, no man has power over the wind to contain it. This particular verse has two translations because there are two different Hebrew sentences in different manuscripts. And both of them, I think, make the same point. No man can hold, hold back or hold over or contain the power of the wind. The wind is a mysterious thing, isn't it? We can't see it, but we certainly feel it. And there's no way that we can really stop it. But the Hebrew word ru'ah not only means uh, wind, but it also means breath or the breath of life. And in this particular context, this one fits also. For notice what it says. No man has power over a life to contain it, over the breath of life to contain it. So no one has power over the day of his death. As no one is discharged in a time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. I think what Solomon is saying to us is that there are things in life that we just can't change. It is not within our power to change them. We can't control the wind, and we can't ultimately control the length of our life. Oh, I don't think he's going to bring suicide or Dr. Kevorkian into such a discussion in his mind. But we really can't say to ourselves, I'm going to live for such and such a time. And I'm going to control the day of my funeral. You can plan it all you want, but when you're gone, you're gone. <laughs> Those who remain are going to do what they want to do. We cannot control if we are in uh, the military service and we are in a time of war. You can't go up to your sergeant or your commander and say, uh, you know what? I've gotten tired of this Kosovo conflict. I miss the family. I think I'm going to be going home. Those of you who have been in the military service understand that your life belongs to that commander. And so you can't say to them, you know, it's not a good day today. Didn't get up in the best of moods. You guys go on without me. I'll catch up later on. You can't say that. And when there's a war, you're in for the duration. You may have signed up for a certain amount of years, but in uh, ancient Near Eastern history, when there was war, you were in for the duration. And a Roman soldier didn't go anywhere until the war was over. And when it comes to wickedness, those who are caught in wickedness will not be released as long as they practice it. There is a bondage. We all face sin. We all face wickedness. We all face failure. But if we continue to practice that wickedness and practice that failure, we will never break its hold that is upon us. And often we need help to get out of those practicing behaviors. And as long as we practice it, wickedness will not release it. Yes, there are things in life that we cannot change. And in those circumstances, the only things that we can do is change in relationship to them. We are the ones that must adjust Verse 9, all this I saw as I plied my mind to everything done under the sun. There is a time when a man lords it over others to the man's own hurt. Yes, terrible leaders can bring terrible times upon their people. What about Slobodan Milosevic right now? What about Saddam Hussein? Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines, or probably the best known in history, Adolf Hitler. Rulers that lord it over people bring problems upon their people. And people who try to ultimately control people will find that it does not work to anybody's best interest. And so Solomon says to us, 
obey the king. In other words, I think the application for us is follow the protocol. I understand in industry and at times there is a need for a whistleblower. A person who has gone to their superiors and said this is wrong or this is a danger or this is a problem and you ultimately have no choice but to go around them or over them or behind them because of safety issues or things like that. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about as citizens of heaven, living on earth, we ought to be good citizens of earth. We ought to be good employees or employers. We ought to be good neighbors. We ought to be good citizens in our schools. And when there are problems, we need to follow the way of wisdom, the way of procedure, and the way of proper, proper timing. The second area that uh, Solomon will speak about concerning wisdom is found in chapter 8, verse 10, through chapter 9 and verse 1. He says, God-fearing men are better off than the wicked in spite of life's unexplainable iniquities because their lives are in God's sovereign control. Now, the... Old Testament teaches a principle of retribution. But it is a principle. It is not an absolute. The New Testament teaches a principle of retribution. That is, you reap what you sow. That what you do comes back upon your own head. The principle of retribution teaches that wickedness will reap wickedness, and that righteousness will reap righteousness. But there are exceptions to the principle. And this is what Solomon addresses. In chapter 8, verse 10, he says, Then too I saw the wicked buried at rest, those who used to come and go from the holy place, and they would receive praise in the city where they did this. This, too, is meaningless. Solomon noticed that in the temple there were frauds. There were hypocrites. There were people who just outwardly went through the motions for public appearance, for traditional practice. So, you know, who knows what the motivations were? But they would go through the practices in the temple. But outside the temple, it was wickedness. It was sin. It was evil. And yet uh, they would receive praise. You know, maybe they were giving a lot of money. You remember the story that Jesus spoke of the little widow's might in the temple? They were all standing around and watching the people give their money into the treasury. And it talked about when they gave their money that the trumpet would sound. We know from archaeology that into the large chest, the collection chest of the temple at one point, they put a long, large brass kind of a horn. And it allowed the people to throw their money into the horn and then the change or the coins would ring around the sound of the horn. And the louder the horn, the more praise would come to the people. Oh, look at brother so-and-so, you know, giving all of that money and what a wonderful thing. I get a little sick sometimes when I read about these very, very wealthy, wealthy people giving, you know, $100,000 or a million dollars and the whole world praises them. It's like, come on. That's chump change, right? That's, what are we praising them for that? That's just good PR, maybe. Well, maybe they're sincere, but it's not like they're hurting. And so they would ring the trumpet. Well, Jesus watches this widow come up and, and drop the smallest of coins in there, probably didn't even make a noise. But he recognized her great sacrifice. Yes, uh, the religious world is filled <laughs> with hypocrites. And as Solomon looked in his day, he said, you know, this is really meaningless. 
it's absolutely meaningless to go to the temple to carry on religious activity, to carry on as if you are spiritual, when in fact your life is filled with sin. Verse 11, when the sentence for a crime or a sin is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. Solomon says punishment has to be quick. Punishment has to be swift. Judgment has to be sure. And if you don't have that, what is the reaction of society? The tendency is to say, hey, I got a 1 in 10, 2 in 10, 3 in 10 chance of getting away with it. This is a great problem in America, isn't it? Our justice system is so concerned about fairness and rightness and procedures that it can take years and years and years before there is any accountability. Solomon says, you know, if a crime is committed, the punishment ought to be quick. Because if there isn't punishment, then the hearts of the people will scheme about other things that they can do. Verse 12, although a wicked man commit a hundred crimes. Now, that's the NIV translation. The word crimes is simply a general word which means acts of evil. So it doesn't necessarily have to be violations of the law, but violations of God's law. Although a wicked man commits a hundred crimes and still lives a long time, he says, I know it will go better with God-fearing men who are reverent before God. When I was a child, I was taught that crime didn't pay. But I've seen enough of the newspaper and news stories to know that for some people, it does pay. That evil acts sometimes bring prosperity that sometimes it brings uh, uh, things in life that otherwise you may not have. But Solomon says, at the end of life, you will give an accountability. And that the one who fears God and who is reverent before God is the one who will ultimately be blessed. The Salvation Army post that's over by our house has a... uh, little phrase on there this week. It says, read the Bible. There's going to be a quiz. And uh, there is going to be an accountability in life. And there are times when people say, I'm going to get ahead no matter what it costs or who it costs. And this is unfortunate. We need to understand that we can only, quote unquote, get ahead in life as we fear God, as we reverent Him, and as we seek to be pleasing to Him. Verse 13, he says, Yet because of the wicked, because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. Generally speaking, wickedness costs in quality and quantity of life. Wickedness and sin is a lifestyle that ultimately hurts us. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Paul says, Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful desires, from those sinful desires will reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. James says this, he says, after sin or desire has conceived, the thoughts of sin have conceived, then it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like a shifting shadow. Yes, the good things of life come from God, and the bad things of life are things that God tells us to avoid. Verse 14, there is something else meaningless and frustrating to me, says Solomon, that occurs on the earth. At times, righteous men who get what the wicked deserve, 
and wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. Solomon recognizes that there are exceptions to the principle. There are times when righteous and good people have terrible, terrible things happen to them. And there are times when wicked or sinful people have wonderful, wonderful things happen to them. But those things happen here on earth. And one, one phrase that I hope you'll contemplate and think about after this morning is that mankind, you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, should not measure God's love by the blessings on earth or lack thereof, but rather on his promises for eternity. There are times, Solomon said, when I see the wicked blessed and I see the righteous blasted. And that really, really bothers me. And I can appreciate that. I've been there. I've done that, probably on both sides. But that is looking at a portion of time, not looking at what God is doing in eternity. Verse 16, he says, When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to observe man's labor on earth, his eyes not seeing sleep day or night, then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all of his efforts to search it out, man cannot dis discover life's meaning. Even if a wise man claims he knows, he cannot really comprehend it. I think what Solomon is saying here is that there are things in life, there are exceptions to the principles that we're just not going to figure out. You can analyze them, you can go back and look at the whole history of it, you can try to figure it out, and it's just not going to happen. It is beyond us. It is too complicated. It is too convoluted. And so there are times when you just have to, by faith, trust the Lord. We like to figure things out. We like to understand, well, how did this happen? And, 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 and that's good at times to try to look for causes or look for sources. But there are times in life when it just doesn't make sense, can't figure it out. The more you try to figure it out, the more frustration it is going to be for you. And it's better to just move on. You're not going to be able to change life's circumstances, but you can certainly change your relationship in those circumstances. Verse 1 of chapter 9, he concludes, So I reflected on all of this, and I concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they are doing is in the hands of God. But no man knows whether love or hate awaits him. The ultimate theology that Solomon gives us for life, for its perplexities, for its complexities, for its uncertainties, for its unexplainable, unexplainable events, is to know this, the righteous and the wise person's life is in the hands of God. Allstate tries to comfort us with that, don't they? Isn't it Allstate tries to comfort us? You're in good hands with Allstate until you have a claim or something, you know. <laughs> and then, uh, did I, do I know you? <laughs> but with God, we are in good hands. And there are times in life when we are just not going to be able to explain why events happen. Why does this righteous person, this good person, this young person die early? Why does this missionary crash in an airplane? Why does this wicked person seem to be enjoying life so much? Why do they get away with such a crime? 
we need to reflect on this and to know the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But, he says, no man knows whether love or hate awaits him. When you find yourself in difficult and hard situations, I know we try to do what is the very best. But you know what? We're not in control of the circumstances or the other people. You can try to do something completely right, and you maybe do it completely right. But anger or hate or resentment might face you anyways. And it's not because you did something wrong. It's not because you didn't maybe have the proper procedure or the proper time. It's because there are things that are out of your control. So often we find ourselves, you know, at work or in school or in relationships or family or so on and so forth, where you're trying to make things right, but everything you do doesn't work out right. That's not in your control. That's not in your control. All you can do is seek to live wisely, to live righteously, and to trust God that in everything that you're doing, that he will work it out, for it is in his hands. Yes, Solomon says, who is a wise person? A wise person, he says, is somebody who follows principles and procedures in times of obedience to superiors. A wise person is someone who will know that their life is in the hands of God and that they cannot control all of circumstances, but they can control how they will act and react in the midst of those.